everyone. I want to start off by having everybody take a deep breath. This is not just for my benefit, but it does help me too. And close your eyes. I promise no parlor tricks. If there were ever a time in my life that I could make myself disappear, I would try to do it now, but that's not possible. So with your eyes closed, I want you to think back to May of this year. And most specifically, that week right before Memorial Day weekend. Okay, got it? Open your eyes. Now I bet, if I were to say to you, raise your hand if where you were was in back-to-back -back Zoom calls, a lot of you would be raising your hand right now. And trust me, I feel your pain. Some of you would be saying, I was sitting in a classroom. And others would say, I was gearing up for a vacation. And the first one I was able to take in a long time, and I was really excited. Remember back to May? The world was starting to feel like maybe we were going to get back to normal. Like, normal was like there on the horizon, like you could touch it. Remember that feeling? Yeah, I don't. Because in the week before Memorial Day, I was sitting in a windowless room in the basement of a hospital, actually our incident command center, and not doing what you might think I was doing. I wasn't there talking about COVID. I was there with my colleagues talking about how the youth mental health crisis was really overwhelming our entire system of pediatric care. You see, for the last many months, a lot of the other services in the hospital had really decreased. That wasn't the case with our mental health services. Prior to the pandemic, you could get an outpatient appointment, maybe three or four weeks of a wait. But now, we were talking a nine-month wait. Imagine being a parent calling asking for help and getting the reply, we'll see you next year. Additionally, our emergency department was seeing volumes that were off the chart. We had seen over a 75% increase in the number of youth with mental health crisis that were coming in just through our emergency department. And the numbers coming into our intensive care units were equally as staggering. Prior to the pandemic, kids who were coming in via ambulance or flight for life maybe two or three times a month with mental health issues. And now our EMS providers were responding five to seven times a week. EMS providers were asking for additional support to be able to cope with what they were seeing. On any given Sunday, half of the people waiting in our emergency department at Children's Hospital Colorado were there with a mental health crisis. Our inpatient psych unit remained full, and at times kids were actually living with us because there was nowhere for them to go out in the community. Because as we were seeing all of this increased need, we were seeing facilities out in the community with hundreds of beds close. And we were seeing providers actually leave the profession altogether. So you can imagine, picture a cup already full of water and you turn on the faucet full blast. The water just keeps spilling out and over that cup because there's nowhere for it to go. And that's how we were feeling at the hospital. We needed help. This wasn't something that we could do on our own. And that's why on May 26th, 2021 of this year, Children's Hospital Colorado declared a pediatric mental health state of emergency because we needed help. And why the use of the phrase state of emergency? Well, think about it. When governors declare a state of emergency, when there's a big fire, what happens? You have fire crews from all over the country show up and start helping you fight the fire. And that was our goal. We thought, if we start describing this problem to everybody else, we're gonna get help. People, resources are surely gonna flow in and we're gonna have a lot of support in addressing this problem. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. And so we were left to figure out some things for ourselves. So amidst a pediatric mental health crisis, what do you do? Where do you go with this? What is the solution? Well, we begin with education, strategic investment, and comprehensive building. So let's talk about the education piece for a minute. I know earlier today you heard about 
people giving awareness to how common the practice of understanding CPR or the Heimlich maneuver is, right? If someone's choking, you know what to do. You administer the Heimlich maneuver. If someone is unconscious and not breathing, you know what to do. You administer CPR. Well, we need to have the same confidence and competence in administering mental health first aid. We need to understand how to spot the signs of mental health needs and know how to intervene. And equally as important, know when we need to hand it off and who to hand it off to. There are mental health first aid courses available just about everywhere you turn and for free of charge. It's something we should all be doing. The next thing we need is we need to be able to better resource and educate mental health providers. The number of kids that are having incredibly severe crises continues to rise. 75% of the children coming into the emergency department right now at Children's Hospital Colorado, even after they've been assessed and stabilized, can't go home because they need that much more additional support. That's a staggering percentage and a lot of our mental health professionals are not properly supported to be able to meet that increased need. We also need additional access points. So that means we need to educate new providers on how to deal with some of these mental health issues. The American Academy of Pediatrics recently reported that the number of kids coming through pediatricians' offices with mental health issues has doubled. Pediatricians aren't trained to deal with mental health issues, but they could be and they probably should be. We need their help. They need to serve the children that are coming into their offices. We need more people in the game. Finally, we need to educate lawmakers. And this is actually a really easy and straightforward message. There are too many kids in need and too few resources to serve them. We need investment, and we need it now. So let's talk about the investment piece. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars to build and operate a successful mental health system of care for youth in a state. Now normally, that's a showstopper. That's where the conversation both starts and ends. But we have a unique opportunity at this time in our history because unlike any other time, there are billions of dollars flowing to states, local governments, and even schools. We should be conscientiously braiding together those revenue streams to create a foundational investment in youth mental health. We also need to be intentional about carving out specific investments for kids. So for example, right here in the state of Colorado, the governor has set aside $500 million to support mental health services. That's a big deal. That's a major victory. But we need to take it a step further we need to dedicate a very significant portion of those dollars directly to kids, because otherwise kids get swept up and they don't get the resources that they need. And there's really a simple, straightforward formula for this. In the state of Colorado, kids make up 30% of our population, so 30% of the funding should go to support kids. The next thing we need to do is we need to advocate for the federal government to also dedicate additional resources. The current money that is coming into states and local governments and schools are one-time dollars that are coming through the American Rescue Plan Act. That means three years from now, those funds won't be here. In the current multi-trillion dollar budget package that Congress is debating, only $85 million is being set aside for youth mental health. That's abysmal. We often joke that Congress is famous for building bridges to nowhere. Well, this isn't even an investment in a pylon. The federal government needs to set aside more money for youth mental health to be able to help states maintain and operate functioning systems of care for their kids. States are also gonna have to think differently about their long-term investment, and they're gonna have to get creative. First, they need to make the most of every single federal matching fund. What does that mean? Well, all of us pay into a huge giant pot of money that gets shifted off to the, the federal government. Well, in some instances, some of those dollars can come back to states, match state investment, and essentially double the efficacy of the effort. We need to be squeezing every juice out of that orange with federal matching opportunities. We can also get creative. So while Colorado has not done a good job 
in building a functioning system of care for youth mental health. What we have done a pretty good job at is building a system of legalized pot. Right here in the Mile High City, we bring in hundreds of millions of dollars every year with marijuana revenue. There's no reason that we can't carve out a portion of those funds to support youth mental health. We tax sin taxes on alcohol and tobacco and gaming to fund other important social causes like education and research. There's no reason states can't do this with youth mental health as well. In fact, 38 states in this country have some form of legalized marijuana. This is a massive opportunity that can be taken advantage of tomorrow. Voters should support these kinds of measures when the questions come before them. And what about local governments? Well, it's interesting. There are things we can do creatively with local sales tax revenue. Right here in Denver, 25 cents on every dollar goes into a program for mental health services for Denver residents. This is a model that can be easily repl replicated in cities throughout not only the state, but through the country. And what about our schools? Well, schools are taking in more money through both the ARPA funds and through Medicaid and schools dollars. The problem is, is that so often, I know this is gonna surprise us all, there's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape they have to jump through in order to access those dollars. We need to change those requirements. We need to not make it so difficult for schools to utilize these important dollars to support youth mental health. And we need to get rid of ridiculous requirements like the only kind of provider that you can use these funds to support are psychiatrists. There aren't enough psychiatrists out there to be able to make use of the money. We need to get rid of ridiculous requirements. We need to make it easier for schools to be able to use this money in order to support their kids. Schools have also gotten creative in passing their own mill le levies with direct components dedicated to youth mental health. It's another opportunity for communities to come together and say, we are going to invest in this. We can do that, and we should. We should also think differently about the private sector and corporate social responsibility and funds that can be created in that space. This won't surprise you either when I say that major entities like our big friends at Facebook, which we all know with growing recognition, have direct contributions to the current youth mental health crisis. There's no reason we can't create corporate social responsibility funds that help youth mental health systems of care throughout the country. We have major opportunities in this space, and it's time that we take advantage of those opportunities. So once we have that money, what do we do with it? Well, we build a functioning system of mental health care, and it needs to start with effective access to prenatal care, because good mental health starts in utero. We need to make sure that our schools have integrated programs, communities have their own ability to respond with crisis services, that we're supporting mental health care in the home, and for kids who need those additional supports, we need effective, quality and competent residential treatment centers, and we need to support our foster families. After Children's Hospital Colorado declared a pediatric state of emergency, we were met with silence. And then a few state leaders went as far as to say, this is just a gimmick. With suicide being the leading cause of death for kids in the state of Colorado over the age of 10, I can assure you, this is no gimmick. With one in four children sitting in the inpatient unit at Children's Hospital Colorado right now needing to be shipped out of state to get the additional care that they receive, I can assure you this is no gimmick. The time to act is now. We have a unique opportunity to make the most of investments that are already coming into our states, our local governments, and our schools. If we don't act now, the lockdown generation becomes the lost generation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.